turn to Isaiah chapter 43, please. <clears throat> Isaiah 43, verse 25. What is this thermostat on? Fifty up, seventy. Okay. 40, 43, verse 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue our case together. State your cause that you may be proved right. Now, he who, okay, maybe I should say it. There's our transgressions and iniquities. And what he does is he wipes these out, okay? He, and that's important in, in, uh, with our iniquities, and our transgressions, iniquities, he removes from us. And the transgression, it says that he wipes out. Look in Isaiah 44, please. <clears throat> 44, verse 22. I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud, and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me. Why? Because I have redeemed you. Psalm 51, 1. Now, this one is, is important because this is kind of the words that we, we use. You see these, these words used fairly frequently with transgression. We'll start in verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. <clears throat> to blot out it was an early uh, phrase because if, if you're writing something and in the old days they didn't have erasers and they didn't have um, delete, 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 your backspace, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have whiteout. It had been invented until, it was invented in the 70s. Um, but, it, but when, with whiteout, that was what they actually did. If there was a mistake, you took whiteout, which you can still get, and you, you took that and you put it over the mistake, and it made it look like white paper. Okay, so, but what, what were they doing? Blotting it out. And, and before they were able to, before whiteout was invented, they would take ink, and I can tell you, I did this growing up, you went, oh, no, I just wrote that down, and it's wrong, and you scratch it out. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk about it that though. You scratch it out. In other words, you put a, a blot of ink over it with some something, and you blot that out, and you can't see what was written there anymore. It's blotted out. Uh, <clears throat> so, anyway, that's important. Turn to uh, Psalm 65.3. Uh, oh no! I tell you what. Well, Psalm one o three twelve. Turn to one o three. Psalm one o three, <clears throat> verse twelve. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. He has removed our. And you you see the, again the picture that is consistent through all of Scripture. Um. Forgiveness, by the way, I'll turn to, uh, let's, let's do, turn to Psalm 65, 3. 65, verse 3, and I want to look at something. Uh, we talk about, we use this verse in the iniquity teaching because it first speaks up of that. Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgressions, you forgive them. Now, forgiveness in the Hebrew actually means the the word in uh, literally means to to bear or to carry off and so now again we have that picture that we see of the scapegoat well what is my part with transgressions well first and and i think it's fairly obvious i need to confess them turn to psalm 32 <clears throat> 5 please psalm 32 
It's important. The important part of, tra of, uh, of confession is you speaking it out. You think God already knows you did it. Uh, well, yeah. But when you are confessing it, you're doing something. You're humbling yourself. And you're saying you are agreeing with God. I mean, confession, I wish most people understood this. Confession is pretty simple. You're, it's your agreement with God. This is why the, the meditation, memorization of prayer, of, I mean, of Scripture is important because that's an agreement with God. My tongue is finally agreeing with God. Okay, so Psalm 32, 5. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Interesting that all three in there, the sin, iniquity, and transgression are in that particular verse. So turn to Psalm 51 again. Fifty-one, three. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. If you know it, you might as well confess it. I assure you, God knows it. Okay, the the next step uh, that I think, and by the way, these are this is not a one-time thing. Boy, Satan has pulled one on us off that one. I'll confess your sin one time, and you're you're fine. Uh, and and then. You don't ever think about, well, maybe you're sinning as a Christian, which if you're actually a Christian, you are going to realize it more than you ever realized it before. Uh, you're going to go, oh, I was wrong there, and you're going to be grieved over it. You're going to mourn over your sin. And the only way out of it is asking God to, and, and this is asking God to blot out, to blot out and remove your transgressions. Uh, he is faithful to do that. Why? Because his son took them for us. And you need to understand when we read the, the things about Jesus, this is what Yeshua has done at the behest, the, the request of his father. And Jesus came and he, his back, I believe, I think of it this way, because remember we've talked about the, the scourging that he received. And uh, when you think what they did to him then is uh, laid him down on that board and the scripture says that, oh, oh, where is that? I, don't, I, I can't believe I don't have it in here. Where uh, that he, didn't it say in the New Testament he blotted out yeah, Colossians. Where's that? Colossians 2. What does it say? Uh, basically, that he took the writ of accusation. Yes, thank you. And nailed it to the cross. The writ of accusation that was against us and nailed it to the cross. The accusation was transgression, <clears throat> and it said that he nailed it to the cross. Now, I think of that writ of accusation on the cross, and then that, and this is the picture that I get, but not a very pleasant one. Don't try this at home. Um, his back, that torn, bleeding, nothing left of it, back, going over that writ of accusation that was against us. And that, that writ of accusation would have been blotted out by what? His blood, you see, in, in which, remember, because of the leaders laying their hands on him, and they laid their hands on him, and he, they, when they did that, what happened? Remember, when, when the, the scapegoat is there and the high priest lays his hands on it, what happens? He becomes one with the scapegoat. But remember, on the high priest's garments, he has, on, there, on, on the shoulders, six names. On this shoulder, six names on this shoulder, 12 over his heart. And that's the names of the, the tribes of Israel. And he is representative. He's the go-between. He is the at one -ment. He's at one with Israel. 
and he becomes one with the scapegoat. And in our case, the, the high priests and the Romans laid hands on Jesus, becoming one with him, and we are one with them because they represent the world, and that would be me. There's my representative. Ooh. Uh, <clears throat> they laid hands, and we're, it all became, we became at one with him. And so when he laid down <clears throat> and blotted out the writ of accusation against us all, it was at the, as the representative sacrifice for sin, iniquity, and transgression that these things happened. And the at one of all, the entire world, uh, was laid upon him. Um, turn to, now this is a little more. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that one. Um, turn to 1 Timothy 1, please. 1 Timothy 1. Uh, the next step after our confession and asking God to blot out our transgressions or remove our transgressions is to then repent, change our minds toward rebellion. Consider in turn. Let me give you some of my own personal testimony. Uh, when I... Uh, hit high school, I started rebelling. And uh, the middle of my junior year, uh, my dad had gotten out of the ministry so I could be a normal human then. I no longer was the preacher's kid. And I think we all kind of rebelled. Uh, I know I did big time through my high school years after that, my college years, uh, I was simply a, a rebel, rebelled against my parents, rebelled against bosses, rebelled against everybody, thought that I should be in charge, which would have been awful for the entire world. And, but that's the way we <clears throat> rebels, we rebels are. And uh, what finally got to me is I heard a teaching that talked about being under authority and not rebelling. That was new. And uh, I, the Lord had done a major work in my life at my senior year in college, but the rebellion thing, it, any of those things like that didn't dawn on me. Why? I had been taught that once you say, Jesus forgive my sins, that you were all right from that time on, which basically gives you with a carte blanche card to say, I can do anything I want to do. Well, you can't. And, but yet, that's the way that I, I lived. And in, in hearing that, I went to my parents and I said, I've been in rebellion against you. I want to get under your authority. Will you forgive me? They said, yes, sure. And then... I went out and did whatever I wanted to do. Life stunk. I mean, I, and of course, it was everybody else's fault. Um, not quite. So that went on for a year, and I heard the teaching again. I went, oh, you know, Davis, you did nothing except give lip service to that. And uh, <clears throat> the Lord said, so what are you going to do? Oh, go back and do it again. So I did. Mom, Dad, I did bad. I rebelled, and I kept on rebelling, even after I came to you and, and said, will you please forgive me, and I'm going to stop doing it. And I said, I am going to be under your authority. And by the grace of God, it was amazing. I mean, it was amazing what happened in that next year. Um, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you to obey 
anything that any authority tells you to do. Now, I knew that there were problems with that, because what if he tells you to do something illegal or something that's immoral, that authority may do that. And I think the Lord probably had that figured out, that that wasn't going to happen. So for that year, absolute protection against people that would maybe say, well, I'm your authority, you have to do this. They only told me things that I disagreed with. Why would I disagree with them? Somebody help me. Because I was a rebel. I thought I should be in charge. Because I thought I was God. <clears throat> and everybody needed to listen to me. Well, um, my parents told me things that I didn't agree with, but when I did them, God blessed it. My authorities, bosses, told me things to do that I didn't agree with when I did them. God blessed it. I thought, I couldn't believe it because God surely couldn't be blessing the wrong things that these authorities were saying and not take notice of the rightness of the things that I was saying. Uh, I hope you understand my little sarcasm there. I began to learn about uh, something that was certainly a new <clears throat> charged my system, which was humbling yourself and walking in the humility of the Lord Jesus. And he would tell me, obey now, obey now. It was, it was amazing. Anyway, life changed radically. I changed radically. People around me uh, that I prayed for for a long time uh, changed radically just because of that one thing. And... It is, it is important that we understand uh, God's, uh, the way he set up life and authority. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you turn yourself into just something that people walk over. But, wow, that's what Jesus did. Often it is, that is the picture that we do. That we don't defend self. That we go, okay, fine. Uh, I'm being accused and I'll agree with my accuser. Even sometimes when your accuser is accusing you falsely. Okay, fine. Um, but you don't defend self. All of this, and I'm still learning, uh, is, is a new concept for my, my life, but not a new concept for Jesus. He did that. And <clears throat> the thing is, if, if I do not repent of my rebellion, and I do not consider that and turn and change my mind, I can suffer shipwreck. As this First Timothy one nineteen, he says, keeping faith and good conscience, which some have rejected, and suffer shipwreck in, in regard to their faith. A lack of repentance leaves the strongholds, the thorns that are there. See the thorns. We've talked about this, but the thorns are uh, hurts. Uh, things that we become bitter about and that we're entangled in those. And we to, to turn away from those means to repent of them, to get that stuff out of my life, out of my thought processes, out of my belief system, and not give Satan an opportunity. <clears throat> the number one way that Satan has opportunity in your life is through the hurts that have happened to you. He will allow those hurts he will magnify those hurts before you, and then he will keep you from forgiving the people that did the things. Why? They don't deserve my forgiveness. Well, in the same way, we don't deserve the Lord's, but he gave it to us anyway. A lack of repentance will leave these uh, strongholds or the thorns, and again, give Satan an opportunity. Uh, a lack of a clear conscience before God and our authorities gives Satan's jurisdiction over our lives and keeps those uh, false beliefs active and powerful. And as such, I will have no freedom and no peace. And uh, the last thing that we, we need to do as regards to our transgressions is to begin to abide in the Word of God, to abide in the Word of God, in the teaching of Christ, and, and the, specifically the blood covenant, so that we begin to understand what it means to be at one with God. To, to realize, Mrs. Davis and I were talking about this last night, 
And we do. We sit around talking about this kind of thing all the time. She'll say, do you know that you're going to be, you're like God? And I go, well, sure, honey, I know that. And then we go on from there. No, that's not what happens. But we, we, we do mention in our conversation how often Scripture says we're partakers of the divine nature, we're to be called sons of God, he's not afraid to call us brother. Boy, none of that's talked about very often, at least not forcefully, in Scripture. Turn to 2 John, if you would. And again, we're talking about saying in the teaching of Christ. What does that mean? You're in Him. You're in Him. 2 John. Ms. Davis, will you read this for us? 2 John, chapter 1, verse 9. 2 John Anyone 1, who, 9. Okay, I'm sorry. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Interesting. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide. Now, the word abide means to live in. This is where you live. Does not live in that teaching of Christ, does not have God. The one who lives in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Again, living in it is I'm one with that teaching. And since I'm one with the teaching, I'm one with Christ and one with God. And we'll turn to really slam this home to John, John chapter 14, please. The gospel, the gospel of John. Every once in a while I like to put on my theological voice. John chapter 14, please. And we'll go to one that has become my favorite, 21. John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. Um, look down to verse 23 now. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. We will come to him and make our abode with him. And we're not going to go into what keeping means. Uh, there's a lot of different places in the teaching. There's some that are specifically about that. But, uh, folks, one of the reasons that the church in the United States and so many other places is so weak is because we've stopped abiding in the Word. The pastors and the preachers teach a, a social gospel. Uh, they teach things that uh, are just uh, you go out and get busy for Christ and not what the true good news is. Um, I want us to turn to Romans chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2. These these are some of the most important verses. I don't think we understand them, but now I, I want to set, let me set something up in some ways here. We see God giving very specific instructions about the tabernacle and the the service that the uh, Levites, the priests were to do at the tabernacle. And we have tried to, and especially after the temple, copy this and make it into a thing of this world. And that, that service that we see there, it wasn't a church service. Uh, it was to indicate life. And I want us to think about that in terms of what... Uh, a real church service is. We're about to read what a real church service for you is. One place that it's really strongly defined. Verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is what? Your spiritual service of worship. 
Whoa. This is the only place that I know of in the entire New Testament that says, there is your, your spiritual worship service. This is it. You want it? This is it. You're supposed to be daily presenting your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. And, but there's only one way you're going to do that. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean? It means meditation upon Scripture, changing the belief system in your heart. How or why? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. What does he mean by proving what the will of God is? Well, that takes us back to verse 1. You're presenting your body a living and holy sacrifice. Hey, come here and do this with us. I can't do that. Why? I, I'm a living and holy sacrifice. I can't do that. And what I'm doing is I am uh, proving by my life what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I, my life, as I receive God's word and it changes my heart, my life proves. Wow, my life? My life proves what the will of God is. What's the will of God? That which is good and acceptable and perfect. That's what I'm supposed to be. Um, I want us to, to close with, I'm going to read something from Oswald Chambers. And he says, except you be converted and become as little children. These words of our Lord are true of our initial conversion, but we have to be continuously converted all the days of our lives, continually turn to God as children. If we trust to our wits Instead of to God, we produce consequences for which God will hold us responsible. Immediately, our bodies are brought into new conditions by the providence of God. We have to see that our natural life obeys the dictates of the Spirit of God. Because we have done it once is no proof we shall do it again. The relation of the natural to the spiritual is one of continuous conversion. Boy, this is... This is not what you normally hear. Oh, you got converted. You're once saved, always saved. You walked the aisle once. That's more than fine. And, of course, none of that is what, what it is. And it means continually converted, continually offering my body as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable unto God. The one thing we object to, or I'm sorry, continuous conversion is the one thing we object to. In every setting in which we are put, the Spirit of God remains unchanged his salvation unaltered. But we have to put on the new man. God holds us responsible every time we refuse to convert ourselves. Our reason for refusing is willful obstinacy. Our natural life must not rule. God must rule. The hindrance in our spiritual life is that we will not be continually converted. Let me say it again. The hindrance and our spiritual life is that we will not be continually converted. There are wadges of obstinacy. This is one of our favorite Oswaldisms. Wadges of obstinacy where our pride spits at the throne of God and says, I won't. Whoa. Let me read it again. There are wadges of obstinacy where our pride spits at the throne of God and says, I won't. We deify independence and willfulness and call them by the wrong name. What God looks, like, looks on as obstinate weakness, we call strength. There are whole tracts of our lives which have not yet been brought into subjection and it can only be done by this continuous conversion. Slowly but surely, we can claim the whole territory for the Spirit of God. Ms. Davis, you have anything you want to add into to this? I do. I was thinking, I looked at the quote about Martin Luther, which is very much what Oswald's saying. This is the first of his 95 theses. theses, theses. Uh, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, in Matthew 4, 17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. They begin, continue, and end their life of faith here on earth with repentance. And um, 
I was thinking as you were reading that so much of our transgression is, and I mentioned it yesterday, that we are trying to preserve our life. We are in charge of our life. We may be go, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but we're still living in transgression, living defen in defense of ourselves, protecting ourselves. We have no faith that God is responsible for us. I was looking at how it says in one, the verse where Jesus, when, then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him in regard to a single charge, so that the governor was quite amazed. He didn't defend himself. We, uh, we are not to vindicate ourselves. God says that's his responsibility. It says, your God comes with vindication, I think is how it says, you know, in one of the, I think it's a, one of the Psalms, it may be Isaiah, but it says that that's his place. But our life, we live constantly transgressing in his jurisdiction. I think transgression is just ultimately our setting ourselves up as God in God's temple. I'm responsible for me. And it says, no, I'm to present myself a living sacrifice to him. It says, we'll offer up spiritual sacrifices as living stones. We'll offer up those and priests in his kingdom, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. We are continually to be presenting ourselves, and um, it says in uh, Luke, it says, but uh, all these things, they'll lay hands on you, they'll persecute you, they'll deliver you up, and bring you before kings and governors, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. Make up your minds not to prepare beforehand, beforehand to defend yourself. And I just think we always make up our mind ahead of time to defend ourselves. If this happens, what am I supposed to do? We have no faith in God as our deliverer. Salvation is deliverance. We have no faith that he is able to take care of the things that concern us. It's a continual battle for, I've got to somehow, what is worry, anxiety? I'm in charge of me. I have to be prepared for the future. It's a lie from the enemy. What did he come at Adam and Eve? You are missing out. You have to somehow do something. What did he come at Jesus with? You are the son of God. Do this. Knowing he was hungry. Do that. Each temptation was step out. Do something. And our vindication, our, our deliverance for, of self is not our jurisdiction. That's our biggest, that is transgression. It says that, um, and I've quoted this before, St. Augustine, Augustine, however you want to say his name, he regularly prayed, and this would be good for us all, oh Lord, deliver me from the lust of always vindicating myself. We're reading about Watchman Nee learning to be quiet before accusation. That, that's not just I'm quiet. There's a, this, the thing that's there that we have to meditate on is God's responsible for me to care for me. And we don't believe it. We live in a world that says you take care of yourself. You go for the gusto. You do everything to preserve your life. Oh, no, this is going to happen. Even the... the <laughs> um, all these Christian things, the rapture is going to happen. It's going to happen on September 20th. What is today? That's tomorrow, so be ready. <laughs> really? Be ready. I'll you be ready. Out there. It's going you, to make us some money. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you be ready. Send in your money. Yeah, deliverance. So we'll have it what is comes. it? You know, all of that is mentality. I've got to be delivered. I will not come out of the great tribute or great tribulation, like it says. The ones that have washed their robes and made them white, as they came out of great tribulation, not they were kept from it. And we're just constantly trying to deliver ourselves from great tribulation. <laughs> and Jesus said, that's not in my care to know those things. That's not my, my jurisdiction. We just need to know him. 
this is eternal life. To know the one and the one and only true God, the true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent to abide in life. To recognize, wait, I need to repent, Lord. You know, he's been saying that to me lately. What am I, where am I not walking with you, Lord? Speak to me. Cause me to press in and stay close to you and confess my sin constantly. Be repenting as he wants to deal with me so I stay close to him. That's what walking in the life he has for us is. It's making, he's making the mountains, bringing them low. It says he will do that. I love the quote from Madame Guyon. I won't, it's, won't get it perfect, but it's on the nothingness of man, God builds his greatest work. He first has to go in and raise, or A-Z-E, the pompous edifice that man has built and destroyed and out of those horrible ruins he he brings forth and erects something that's built it's holy it's glorious because he's done it i'm not quoting it exact but that's what he's after is bringing us to the place that is you know he thinks himself to be something is when he's nothing deceives himself bringing us to that place where he can work jesus before the before Pilate didn't vindicate himself, didn't say anything to the point that Pilate was amazed. There was, how can a man be that way? You know, we are the sons of God. We're to walk. That's who God is conforming us into, that very likeness, where people go, how can a person be like that? You're from a different planet, Betsy. <laughs> And that's what God wants. That's what he's bought us for. That's why Jesus bore all those things so that we can become sons and daughters of God. Anyway, just things that the Lord was bringing to mind as you were talking. So. Yes, thank you. Um, and of course, that's the point, is that the, the reason when you get down to it, whether it's at one month, sin, iniquity, transgression, all of those things. The point is, is that God has desired to bring mankind back into uh, his correct position with him, which is that of sons or daughters uh, of the Most High, which is amazing. And to, to be on his ruling council um, uh, over this earth, to make heaven and earth be one. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the understanding and the opening up of this part of Scripture. Lord, I'm, I'm sure this is scratching the surface, and that's all. Because you're always so much deeper than where you get us started on something. But may we understand what it means to transgress, to trespass, to try to control people and all the situations around us, to want to, to have dominion over everything that's not ours. Forgive us where we have, uh, which is often, and Lord, take back that ground, tear out the, the thorns uh, of the hurts, give us the, the grace your strength to forgive and to walk in the freedom and the peace, the liberty of the spirit of Messiah, Yeshua, in whose name we pray and receive these things. Amen.